Lord be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke, chapter 1, beginning at the 26th verse. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Come, Holy Spirit, giver of life and love. Grant us for our blessing thoughts that pass into prayer, prayer that passes into love, and love that passes into life with you forever. Amen. This uh, homily is being recorded and will be uh, on the internet as uh, one of my sermon series sermons. So to those of you who are watching this uh, online, greetings from the Mother's Union Festival for the Feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I want to talk today about three apparitions of Our Lady. Now, it's not very fashionable for Anglicans to be too interested in uh, appearances of the Virgin Mary. We have a healthy uh, scepticism about such things. But I want to talk about these three instances where people believe that they have encountered Mary and uh, what we might learn from those experiences. The first and probably the best known of the uh, um, fairly modern appearances of the Virgin Mary is in the south of France, in the foothills of the uh, mountains that divide France from Spain and it's the little town of Lourdes. And uh, there, about uh, just over 100 years ago, a little French peasant girl believed that she met a beautiful lady who revealed herself as the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, she showed the little girl a place where water was bubbling up out of the ground and uh, said this will be a special place for healing. And uh, so uh, Bernadette went and told her mum and dad who thought she was completely bonkers. And they took her to the parish priest who suggested that she should be given some severe beating to uh, stop her being so uh, self-indulgent. And uh, uh, so she had a pretty bad time psychologically and um, ran away and lived on grass and ate dirt and all sorts of strange and uh, bizarre things. At the heart of the apparition is uh, a simple peasant girl with great faith and not much else and a beautiful lady with a message of healing and hope for the peasant girl. I suppose if you were going to be uh, 
um, sociologically analytical. You'd think that a French peasant girl in the south of France in the 19th century, God the Father was far, far away, the creator of all things. Jesus was busy dripping blood on the cross. The only uh, way she could experience a close, compassionate, loving presence of God would be through Jesus' mum. And so you might explain away the apparition that way. But uh, thousands of people have found it to be a, a thin place, a place where heaven and earth seem very close. And uh, whether or not you have a belief in the apparition, it's certainly a place of great devotion and a place where many very sick people have experienced uh, healing for prayer and have in fact uh, been healed. To go to the Lord today is a bit like going into the medieval world. The uh, place where the apparition happened is very beautiful and, and natural, but all around it are big churches and uh, the, the town, which is outside the walls of the sanctuary, is uh, just what I imagine a medieval market was like. You know, 300,000 different sorts of plastic rosaries, um, statues of Mary that light up and change colour if you put the right batteries in. You know, it's all pretty tacky and unpleasant. But at the heart of things, there's something very deeply devotional about a simple peasant girl encountering the compassion and love and joy of the Mother of the Lord. The second place I want to say something about is in Mexico City and it's uh, called the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe and uh, it's an amazing place. Our Mexicans are very devout uh, Roman Catholics with a great deal of old-fashioned Indian religion combined and so they love processions and loud music and bright colours and flowers and they carry huge uh, pictures of Mary made out of flowers, you know, all through the city. It's just amazing. And uh, the shrine itself is a place where an Indian peasant called Juan Diego believes he met Mary. And this happened during the time of the Spanish rule of Mexico. And so the rules of the church were all Spanish people. And Juan Diego went to see his bishop and said that Mary had appeared to him and told him that it was time that the Spanish were kinder to the American Indians, not the Red Indians, but you know, Central American Indians. And the bishop said, go away, you smell a little Indian. And uh, um, so Our Lady appeared to one day again, and so he went again and spoke to the bishop, and again the bishop failed to take any notice. And so Mary said to, when she appeared the next time to one Diego, one Diego, uh, she said, uh, um, when you go next time, fling your cloak out before him. And so Juan Diego went to the bishop for the third and final time and uh, when he started to be unpleasant and say, go away, Juan Diego threw his cloak on the ground and out tumbled red roses, lots and lots of red roses. Um, and then on the cloak was the image of Mary as if she'd been ironed on. And uh, in the great basilica in Mexico City now, uh, that cloak is behind glass, behind the high altar. And in order to uh, stop pilgrims from staying too long in front of it, there's uh, a walking footpath, uh, an, an automatic footpath. And you have to stand on it and it takes you past the cloak slowly, but you're not allowed to stop in front of it. Again, to contemporary Australian Anglicans, it all seems a bit much, really. A bit over the top. But in fact, what's going on there? The underclass, the poor, the oppressed Central American Indians are being validated by this vision from God. Not a vision of the great creator or of the suffering saviour, but a vision of the compassionate mother of the Lord, who's saying, in a gentle sort of way, tumbling roses and an image on the cloak. Um, God cares about the American Indian people, Central American Indians, as much as he cares about the rulers of the Spanish church. The third image and uh, uh, appearance of Our Lady is the one that we uh, venerate as Anglicans, Our Lady of Walsingham. There she is, looking very pretty by the altar, having one of her uh, two, every two, every six months she has a little outing. She comes from the chapel into the main part of the church. And uh, again, this is an interesting story. 
Uh, it comes from the time of Saxon England, so before William the Conqueror, and uh, uh, a Saxon uh, noblewoman, Rochelle's, had uh, a vision of Mary uh, who appeared to her and uh, gave her the plans for what the Holy House in Nazareth looked like, um, but also, uh, again, another well uh, with healing holy water uh, was uh, found to be just close to where the apparition happened. Now look at that statue for a minute. What it is, is a Saxon princess. See, she's got a Saxon crown on and she's dressed as a Saxon woman would be dressed. And she's holding baby Jesus, he's got his hand up in blessing, um, looking very serene. Even the throne that Mary is on is very similar to the thrones we have left over from Saxon England. So the context is very important. Saxon England was an, in a very difficult place. They were um, at the end of the Vikings. Vikings were ruling large parts of England and the Saxons had tried to get power back but really it was an endless fight. And it was just before the Norman Conquest in 1066 when the Normans, the Norsemen, the Vikings who'd settled in France came and conquered England. And so it was a fairly harsh and brutal world. And into that harsh, brutal world, Rochelles has a vision of the compassion and love of the Virgin Mary, who comes to say, everything will be okay. Here's some beautiful fresh water that you might like to find healing from. This is what my house was like in Nazareth. What's your house like? It's a very domestic and comfortable picture. Next time uh, you have a look and see the strange statue of Our Lady of Walsingham, you might see it with different eyes, thinking about her as a Saxon princess. You know, Mary is culturally contextual in this, this image, just as she is in most of the uh, stories of her appearances. I don't know whether we should believe in the literality of these appearances or not. It doesn't actually concern me particularly. What concerns me is understanding the context and understanding something of the message. And the message, of course, is the same message that Christ shows in his life, teaching, death and resurrection. That God is intimately concerned with us. That he loves us. That he's full of mercy and grace and asks us to be people of mercy and grace and compassion as well. As we celebrate the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary today, we remember that young girl who said yes to God's plans, not having any idea really of what the future would hold, but knowing that what mattered was that the God that she was responding to was always a God of mercy and love and compassion. Those three appearances of the Virgin that I've talked about today have that same message. That's a great message for those of us who love Mother's Union because it's really at the heart of the Mother's Union's ministry to be people and places of compassion, mercy, forgiveness and love. May we long celebrate the Annunciation as a special feast of Mother's Union and may this feast of Our Lady, in whatever context she comes to us, remind us of God's plan of salvation and the goodness that he has towards us in sending us his Son. The Lord be with you.